Welcome everyone to another installment of the Fall Environmental Resilience Speaker Series jointly presented by Indiana University's Integrated Program in the Environment and the Environmental Resilience Institute. I'm Sarah Minty, Director of the Integrated Program in the Environment and Managing Director for ERI, and I'm so pleased that you're able to join us today. Both IPE and ERI are founded on the understanding that interdisciplinary learning and research are essential to teach today's scholars and to solve today's problems, not to mention tomorrow's. So we're pleased to facilitate conversations with some of today's leading environmental resilience experts from across the disciplines to address topics from climate change to the socio-environmental challenges that are affecting our health, our communities, and our economy here in Bloomington and around the world. We're very grateful to Wild Birds Unlimited for making events like this possible by supporting ERI's work and sponsoring today's event. We wish to uh, acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about IPE and ERI. IPE was founded in 2012 by the provost and the leadership of the O'Neill School, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the School of Public Health to bring together all of the environmental and sustainability scholarship across the various schools and departments on the Bloomington campus. And ERI was founded in 2017 as part of the IU Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge. Its mission is to enhance resilience to environmental change in Indiana and beyond by accurately predicting impacts and effectively partnering with communities to implement feasible, equitable, and research-informed solutions. We've worked really hard uh, this year to, to bring you a robust set of speakers Every other Friday at noon, we have these resilient speakers. Um, in about uh, a couple of weeks, we're going to have our final talk of the semester. I'm pleased that we'll be hosting Kate, Caitlin Alcantara. So mark your calendars for that. You're going to be able to find information uh, about each of the talks on ERI and IBE's web pages and in our regular newsletter and upcoming events notices that our organizations send out. So we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so you'll get reminders about upcoming talks, as well as other news and events that we publicize. Finally, logistics on how you can engage with our speaker today. Please put questions into the chat box as you think of them. We will monitor those throughout the speaker's talk and there'll be an opportunity for us to ask those questions at the end. Before we begin, I do wanna acknowledge again, a couple sponsors that have made today's event possible. Our fall speaker series is sponsored by the Mester 2021, focused on resilience. Uh, this is an initiative of the IU College of Arts and Sciences, and we're thankful for their uh, support. And then today's talk is also sponsored by Wild Birds Unlimited. At long last, let me introduce today's speaker, Don O'Neill. Don is Vice President and Executive Director of the Audubon Delta, a unified regional headquarter that will headquarters that will protect birds and places they, they need uh, all across Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi. Prior to joining Audubon, O'Neill served as Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Nature Conservancy, where she developed and stewarded several long-term strategies to help conservancy scientists build emotional intelligence, enhance technical capacity, and develop skills to enrich, co enrich collaborations with stakeholders and increase the impact of conservation outcomes. She has experience directing projects and leading research efforts at national and international levels with research experience in climate change biology, life history evolution, disease ecology, and ecophysiology. O'Neill holds a BA in environmental studies from Washington University and a PhD in ecology from Indiana University. She's also an adjunct professor at the University uh, at Al Albany State University of New York. Welcome, Don. I'm going to turn the screen over to you now, and uh, and we welcome your talk today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sarah. All right. 
So thank you, thank you so much for the invite. I see Ellen's face over there. She was my PhD advisor when I was here at IU. She said wonderful, glorious things about me in the past. Today, we share a little bit of nervousness, I guess I'll say about presenting. And I want more than anything to be like, Ellen, you're up. Like she did to me once when I was a PhD student. She sent me to Veracruz to give this keynote speech. And I don't wanna say she failed to, but no one was expecting me in the room. So. I appreciate, again, the invite and so glad to see some faces that I recognize. If it's not obvious, connection or interconnection will be a major theme of this talk. And I want to flag that this interconnectedness will show up in Audubon's conservation priorities and actions, the habitats in which we work, and even how people and birds are connected. Hold on, we are, there we go. But to start, I want to note a major thread that's bringing it all together, at least in the continental US, and that is the Mississippi River, connecting eight different habitats across 3,912 miles. From the Great Lakes of Michigan, Superior, Huron, Erie, and Ontario, the largest surface freshwater system in the world, to the prairie pothole region, depressional wetlands, primarily freshwater marshes, found most often in the upper Midwest over to the Great Plains, which shelters roughly 1,600 plant species, 95 mammal species, 220 species of butterfly, and astounding 300 species of birds. Through bottomland forests found along rivers and streams of the Southeast and South Central United States, generally in broad, broad floodplains, and to Eastern forests, rich in bird species due to the abundance of food and shelter provided by the trees that produce fruits, nuts, and berries to eat. And then through portions of Appalachia, the oldest mountain range in North America, whose ridges and valleys form some of the most biologically diverse ecosystems in North America. Over to sections of piney woods, coniferous forests dominated by several species of pine, as well as hardwoods, including hickory and oak. And then ending with coastal wetlands, historically formed through the active delta building process of the Mississippi River and is continually being reshaped and reformed as fresh water and sediment makes its way into the Gulf. Approximately 60% of all bird species in the contiguous US currently utilize the Mississippi River and its tributaries and or its associated floodplains. And Audubon's networks of chapters, nature centers, national and state staff, partners and supporters creates a seamless web of conservation. The flyways traveled by birds each spring and fall inspire Audubon's model for organizational alignment, helping us to further coordinate our conservation efforts. The four flyways include the Atlantic Flyway, the Central Flyway, the Pacific Flyway, and then the Mississippi Flyway, where I work, which encompasses six of the major habitats within the Mississippi watershed making an important area for bird migration, breeding, and overwintering. It should come as no surprise that nationally Audubon strategic priorities touch down across this flyway as well. And those priorities are in coasts, climates, water, bird-friendly communities, and working lands. But as an example, Let's see how these priorities might look locally. Here's how those national priorities are interpreted in the Del Audubon's Delta region of Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, which is where I work. To share all of what's happening across the flyway might take me a few days, but today I hope to give you a snapshot into the region, focusing on just a few of these priorities and the work we're doing to build resilience across the flyway. Nationally, Audubon's coastal work prioritizes the most important coastal sites at any stage in a bird's life cycle, breeding, stopover for migrants, and wintering habitat. What is critical to note is that this work isn't contained to our Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf coasts, but also includes coastal habitats along lakes. And while I could regale you with many coastal restoration and stewardship projects happening in the Delta, from our tile tourists as shown here, which help to combat rising water and increasing stones through the construction of earthen platforms that restore natural hydrological processes and breeding sites for birds, while also providing physical buffers for wetlands and shorelands. 
or I can go into detail about our campaign in support of the most ambitious ecosystem restoration project in North America, reconnecting and reestablishing the natural systems that created Louisiana's boot by replenishing the sediment in the wetlands and growing land. I could also mention our stewardship work in Mississippi and Louisiana protecting and monitoring beach nesting birds. But I thought it might be more expect, unexpected to talk about how this work touches down in the Great Lakes region. Powderhorn Lake is a two-bodied lake in South Chicago, shown here, let's see if I can get, with this triangle here and then this long sort of oddly shaped lake. And it's just a couple of miles of the Lake Michigan shoreline. The lead lines represent blockages, a railroad and a road between Powderhorn Lake and Wolf Lake, which connects to Lake Michigan. Historically, Powderhorn Lake was a rich marsh surrounded by rare dune and swale habitat created during the formation of the Great Lakes themselves. So keeping track of this yellow, because I will jump to the present in a moment, but you can see that this area was, is not actually open water or lake back in 1939. But now, as you can see, the water is too deep to sustain a marsh habitat and the water is bursting into the surrounding community. Not only has Powderhorn transitioned from a marsh to a lake, but with increasing storm events, communities are also being flooded. This lake is still one of the most biologically rich in the region, but we've lost many species of breeding marsh birds as a result of losing important functional wetlands. So Audubon is reconnecting the lakes through parcel acquisition, detailed engineering, and over $1 million in fund funding. We're working to reestablish the hydrological connectivity with Wolf Lake to the north, then to reestablish emergent marsh habitat and shallow open water areas in the northern pool, and then installing water control structures to allow the control of funding. Two parcels were acquired, the Wolf Lake connector, which is this long rectangular section here, and the 134th Street square marsh parcel. Two years were then spent on designing a water control structure that will allow managers to lower water levels in the lake, restoring near 100 acres of marsh in the city limits of Chicago and building the capacity for us to adapt to a changing climate. Audubon has now installed three water control structures in Cottonwood, providing a direct climate adaptation tool to landowners. From other water control and wetland restoration projects we've done in the region, we know this can bring back the list of threatened marsh birds. Here you see the return of nine breeding marsh bird species at neighboring big marsh site that has been restored. So 2015, 2016, we were only seeing about three species and now in 2019, we're seeing nine. Climate change is bringing not only more intense storms, but also longer periods of drought and rapid fluctuations of Great Lakes water levels, which can impact vegetation and marsh bird populations as well as the communities surrounding these waters. As a result, we will continue to monitor these water levels at several checkpoints shown here with these red circles to better evaluate marsh health. And we'll be tracking changes in wetland vegetation and composition, marsh bird occupancy and species rich richness, as well as that water level change. We are even engaging the community to participate in the science that helps us understand and better prepare for these changes in large part through these water tracking level stations where you can text in real time data. We also have several stewardship activities for direct community support with the removal of invasive plants and native seed collecting. Across the Great Lakes, Audubon has now completed six wetland restoration resiliency projects marked by those brown flags and 10 more are currently active marked by green flags. And of course, there are future projects for the, region, for the region indicated by those blue flags. These projects are providing critical coastal habitat, cleaning up the lakes and building resiliency to climate change. Speaking of climate change, while one could argue that each of our priorities in some way or another works to address climate impacts, I'd like to share how our climate work dovetails with Audubon's advocacy efforts. Switching back to the Delta region of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, I want to highlight that our work in large part focuses around two agenda items, 
water, such as our efforts along the Gulf Coast and upstream along the Mississippi River, and renewables. Our goal is a resilient green economy, recognizing the benefits of a more sustainable Delta with a diverse portfolio of jobs, initiatives, and programs that incorporate natural climate solutions into a stronger and more prosperous Delta for both birds and people. Our main objective with this policy agenda is to advance a regional suite of goals and metrics focused on long-term resilience for the Delta. To do this, we work, with, we work to leverage legis legislative partnerships under the precept that greater engagement and advocacy will be necessary at the local, state, and federal level to advance our priorities. And we also try to connect to local leaders and advocates in our networks to ensure our work is aligned with the long-term resilience and equity concerns of the people who call this region home. And we go beyond lobbying. So we provide scientific analysis, public input via comment letters. We convene stakeholders together. We lift up other perspectives throughout the community. And we provide information on resources and opportunities for the public to learn how to engage for their own advocacy. And also we raise awareness of the resource Audubon brings to the table, both funding as well as capacity. So what does this work look like in practice? In Arkansas, we recently led a coalition to change a state law prohibiting nonprofits and governmental bodies from installing their own renewable energy systems. By focusing on conservative messaging and non-traditional allies, we were able to garner a great deal of corporate support, bring together the Christian Coalition for a fly-in with local representatives to discuss the act and constituents' views, and build engagement with local community members across the city of Fayetteville and Pulaski County. Our efforts resulted in the enactment of the Arkansas Solar Access Act, allowing nonprofits to use third-party solar services or service agreements to monetize federal clean energy tax incentives. This year, Little Rock Audubon Center became the first 100% renewable powered nonprofit in the state of Arkansas. And galvanized by our efforts, we are using this win as a model for other community solar efforts in Arkansas and across the Delta region. In Louisiana, we worked to pass the Resilient and Renewable Portfolio Standard developed by the Energy Future New Orleans Coalition. This standard establishes a comprehensive path for the city of New Orleans to reach 100% renewable energy by the year 2040 and to reach that target by addressing the greatest challenges faced by residents. Among these challenges are some of the highest energy costs in the country for low and moderate income ratepayers and the ever present demands of the city to be resilient during frequent extreme weather events and power outages. By coordinating a series of events, such as phone polls and phone banking, coffee with council members and op-eds, and spearheading several major tactics, including develop an economic impact report, canvassing and local business sign-ons, and direct meetings with members of the council, a resolution directing the parties to create regulations that would meet the goal of net zero by 2040, and a carbon-free energy portfolio by 2050 was passed. We continue to work with other stakeholders on incentivizing a WEN energy economy in Gulf waters while incorporating best management practices for birds and wildlife, including sponsoring technical conferences, ongoing comments and review, and public informational sessions and panels. And finally, in Mississippi's Yazoo backwater area, we've been working with local communities on a national campaign to safeguard federal protections for up to 200,000 acres of Mississippi flyway wetlands, habitats that support nearly 29 million migrating birds annual. The map on the left here is just orienting to you to the backwater area. So in relation to the Mississippi River and then, then the Mississippi River alluvial valley. And the one on the right here is showing relative abundance for one week of migration of the pectoral sandpiper, which is 89% of, of the global population. The pumps are a false hope for Yazoo communities and US Army Corps data even shows that the area the pumps claim to protect will continue to flood with the purple showing all of the areas that currently flood and the red showing those areas that will no longer flood with pump construction approximately 68% of the backwater will continue to flood with pump construction. 
In 2020, 93,000 members and supporters joined Audubon in sending letters that urged the Army Corps to abandon this destructive agricultural drainage project and instead prioritize immediate affordable flood risk solutions centered around reforestation. Just this fall, the EPA has asked a federal court for permission to reconsider the project, a potentially big win for birds and local communities. So far, I've covered a lot of what Audubon has done, but I'd like to spend these last moments speaking to a few projects to come. One of our most ambitious centers around water. Nationally, Audubon's water priority involves the public on issues surrounding water rights and water quality, restores habitats along rivers, wetlands, and deltas, and explores and implements market-based solutions that contribute to the achievement of our water goals. But to date, we have not had a comprehensive or connected plan around the Mississippi River watershed. Most recently, staff in the Delta, Great Lakes region, and Upper Mississippi region have come together to establish a Mississippi River blueprint. Using spatial prioritization analysis, we were able to identify areas of high value for priority birds and co-benefits for human communities within the region, both now and into the future. So looking at this map, you can see in green, these areas are priority areas to maintain. And these areas are predicted to be high value both now and in the future. And they must be managed appropriately and protected from future development, degradation, fragmentation, and further loss of ecological function. The purple areas are priorities, priority areas to restore. And those areas represent our present condition is impaired or not highly suitable for priority species or human communities, but are predicted to become increasingly valuable in the future, due in part to climate change, reforestation after agriculture, or predicted species shift. Restoration needs can include improving habitat structure, hydrological regimes, or other ecological processes. And finally, these areas in orange represent priorities to adapt. And these are the areas with high values currently, but not in the future. And the shift in this suitability is due mostly to predicted climate stressors or future development. Work on the Mississippi River Blueprint is in its nascent stages, but I can share our three major strategies today. To fill critical science gaps and develop implementation strategies, to advance the policies that promote a healthy and resilient environment, and to engage and uplift the voices of the underrepresented communities who call this region home. More detailed goals and outcomes for the blueprint will come in the new year. Also in the works for the Delta region is an exciting new endeavor around bird-friendly communities and working lands. Yes, they are connected. Nationally, these two separate priorities touch down in two wildly different habitats urban and suburban communities where we champion native plant gardens and lights out initiatives to protect migrating birds and rural managed lands where we work with landowners to increase habitat quality and promote sustainable agricultural practices. In the Delta, these two priorities work hand in hand as part of our Plants for Birds initiative. We have taken the philosophy that each patch of restored native habitat is just that, a patch in the frayed fabric of the ecosystem in which it lies. By landscaping and farming with native plants, we can turn a patchwork of green spaces into a quilt of restored habitat. Our Plants for Birds initiative is working to take three Arkansas, pro Arkansas programs to scale across the Delta region and eventually nationally. Currently, we're working with legislators in the city at state level to pass pros, proclamations, resolutions, and ordinances or, and policies establishing native plant weeks or encouraging and requiring native landscaping, particularly when we're talking about working with government entities such as parks. We've also conducted regional plant sales and education events about native plant gardening to make it easier for individuals and communities to adopt native landscaping and demonstrate the benefits of native plants for birds, in which case more native plants mean more choices of food and shelter, and then for people, because planting many different species of herbaceous flowering plants, shrubs, and trees creates layers of vegetations that deflect rains, increasing the chance for water to be absorbed by your soil before running off into drains and streams. Additionally, native plants are often hardier than non-native ornamentals and thrive without mowing, 
pesticides or fertilizers. Less lawn mowing, fertilizing and pesticide application means cleaner air and water. Finally, our biggest lift is scaling Arkansas's native, native agriculture to invigorate ecosystem project, which has trained new and historically underserved farmers to grow native plants as environmentally friendly, climate change res resistant specialty crop that provides both income and on-farm wildlife habitat. Income is from the sale of the seed to meet the growing need, growing demand for locally sourced native warm season grasses, plus pollinary friendly forbs needed to restore Arkansas's prairies. Restoration of these prairie ecosystems, once home to things like greater prairie chicken, will help other declining grassland species such as the northern bobwhite, grasshopper spar sparrow, and dicosil. Additionally, because grasslands store approximately one third of soil organic carbon, these efforts can have significant benefits for climate change mitigation. Finally, I'd like to leave you all with a call to action because if we act today, we can help most climate threatened birds survive well into the future. Social movements start with each of us. We start groups and when those groups get together, they form coalitions. And when coalitions come together, you form a movement to advocate for the birds and communities we love. Audubon has trainings that take place in, in a convenient webinar format so you can join for home. And then in these interactive sessions, we give you all the tools you need to get started to find your own flock and power your own advocacy efforts. All are welcome. All you need to do is bring along a desire to get involved and change the world for good. But if you're interested in more than just advocacy, you can go to any state or region's website and opt into the emails that are in your interests, climate, coastal stewardship, et cetera, and you'll be able to plug and play as much or little as you like. Our social media channels are also pretty good indicators of what we got going on. And with that, I'll leave you with some contact information and then Sarah, if there are any questions. Thank you, Dawn, that was awesome. You are doing such wonderful work and it's so great to see all of it. Um, I, we do have a lot of questions that have come through the chat. Some of, some of them, I guess most of them actually have come to me just privately. So um, let me, uh, get back to my list here. Okay, well, this is a great one, I think, to start with because, um, you, you know, you, you're talking about the science and you're talking about all the, you know, um, uh, initiatives, uh, policy work that you're doing, but, but somebody asked, um, what drew you to birds? And I think that's a great way to start. It was an accident. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I've told this story to Ellen and others many times. Um, I applied to be a research experience for undergraduate program at Mountain Lake Biological Research Station in Virginia. And I know that I put on my application that I wanted to work in a lab that was doing amphibians or reptiles. And somehow I ended up in Ellen's lab, in the bird lab, studying juncos. And that first summer, there were only four of us because it was a scaled down summer. And I loved it. We were looking at hormones, um, testosterone, and female juncos and its impact on their uh, nesting behaviors. And so I did a lot of work looking at predators. I had a little fake chipmunk and everything that I'd set up next to the nest. And I just fell in love. And then Ellen asked me to come back the next summer to finish the project. And then I went off and I tried out insects and looking at behavior in wasps. And then came time to apply to graduate school. And Ellen was like, you should come to IU. And I was like, oh, birds. And I was like, look, I'll come. And only if I can do a project that I can talk to my mother about, that my mom will understand. And Ellen worked with me to put together a project looking at migration and the impacts of climate change on the junco. And after that, it was history. Wow, that's a wonderful story. And I'm not surprised knowing Ellen Ketterson <laughs> that she spin, spun your world around and, and turned right? you towards that's, yes, yes, that's wonderful. Um, well, speaking of that, you know, in your experience as a, as a student and working with a, a mentor like Ellen, um, I think a student here in the group at, mentions that we have an Audubon campus chapter at IU um, and wondered what advice would you give to students who want to advance bird conservation in their local communities and regions? 
Yeah, being involved in the I think campus chapter is like a really good first step. I will say that I'm sort of getting my head around the campus chapters and the Delta region. And I know that I personally am looking towards trying to incorporate them into my advisory board because I think it's a completely different perspective. And I also know from the standpoint of sort of jumping into the nonprofits, you never really know what you're getting into until you've done it. But boards are a good way to sort of get an understanding. So I know in the Delta region, I'm offering that opportunity. But if you're interested in bird conservation, Audubon is a good place to be. Obviously, you know, you've got the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, they also do bird conservation. But the cool part about Audubon is that's our bread and butter. So we're very focused, first and foremost, on bird conservation and the communities and the habitats in which they live. And so that makes it a lot easier if you were like, that's what my love is and I wanna, like, that's where I wanna focus. Um, if you aren't already, so you're involved in the campus chapter, I recommend getting involved with any of your local non-campus chapters as well. And then just reaching out to staff. We are always looking for volunteers. We really do want to hear from you. It is not a burden and whatnot. So reach out. If you've got ideas in terms of the science you want to see, reaching out to the conservation director, if that's your line or, or your pathway. Also, all good opportunities. Excellent. I love the idea of involving students more um, in, in your governance. Um, I know that a lot of students, but, well, particularly those that are on a science research track, wonder how they should um, balance or if, <laughs> if there really is such a balance anymore between advocacy and science. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that in your experience. Oh, that's a really interesting question. So I will say that getting into advocacy as part of my like job job, if you will, if this is new for me with respect to Audubon, previously it would all have been for personal issues, totally not even related to conservation. And I will say that I feel a little bit like I missed out. And so, and I will say, so after I studied birds with Ellen, I jumped off to study buffalo because I didn't want to be, everybody kept calling me an ornithologist. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm an ecophysiologist. <laughs> um, and I was studying buffalo in Africa and we were looking at parasites and tuberculosis, which are things that show up in your human communities as well. And that was where I sort of had that first inkling of this research and science is really cool, but I wanna be having that impact with respect to these communities. I wanna be involved in conservation. And so I feel a little bit like I found this advocacy bit late in life, and this is exactly what I've been looking for. So I would say there is a balance, obviously, and especially, I mean, from a nonprofit standpoint, and we have all these limitations as it relates to lobbying, but science can inform advocacy, and it makes you have much stronger um, I guess you could say much stronger stance than when you are sort of operating without the facts, without the details, without the research. So in, within Audubon, our science team, our science and conservation teams are integral parts. We are constantly going to them saying, we're providing comment letters from X. We're gonna be joining this public meeting and making sure we have all of those facts that come together along with you know, our passion and our heart when we're making our pleas. Excellent. I, you know, I think that that advocacy work um, obviously can involve community members, right, who are who are non scientists. And so another person asks, what are some of the community outreach initiatives that Audubon Delta is organizing? Um, and I, I just this is making me think back to the, your bio, you know, that you did a lot of work with the Nature Conservancy folks regarding emotional intelligence. And I'm thinking about the fact that you're dealing with communities that flood regularly. You know, how, how do you deal with communities um, in, in your work? Yeah, so first and foremost, I would say is we let the communities drive our work. And, and I will say that it doesn't, while our bread and butter is birds, it doesn't make sense for us to go into a community that's flooding and just talk about the birds. That it's, it's not gonna resonate like that. But the really, I guess you can say interesting part is that in many cases, I would say even in most cases, when it, what's good for birds is good for people. So your birds can be your indicator species. They can let you know what's happening. Audubon just released their survival by degrees report 
um, which sort of lays out how climate change is going to impact birds and bird populations, but also how it's going to impact the communities in which we find those birds. So when we go into communities, we first and foremost are listening, saying, what do you need? What do you want? Most recently, we had Ida who came through Louisiana and did a lot of, de lot of destruction. For us, it has been first and foremost about rebuilding those communities. And so we use our platform to elevate resources and whatnot because we need those communities to then advocate for the birds. And they're not gonna be able to advocate for birds if they are still living in houses without roofs or don't have a place to live at all. So that's how we end up engaging with our communities. Then sort of on that, on, I guess you can say on the straight up advocacy level, we're always reaching out to our communities and source and letting them know about things that are happening in their legislature. And that's one of the like big keys is it's hard to keep track of all of those things unless it's your job. Well, I have a policy director. It's his job to keep track of, hey, what are the environmental, what are the um, conservation, even the environmental justice items that are coming down the pipeline. And when we see something that we're like, hey, this is a concern to this community, we elevate that. We let them know this is a concern. You guys are probably going to comment, come to this public meeting, et cetera, just making sure we can uplift those voices. Because it can't just be Audubon saying, this is wrong. We really need everybody there with us. Right. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about those communities that are flooding and Congratulations on the reconsideration, I suppose, that the Army yeah. Corps will be doing <laughs> regarding pumping. Um, I, I'm curious about, you mentioned the um, alternative solutions that you are suggesting in terms of reforestation and green infrastructure as part of the solution. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the details of, of what you're suggesting um, and how receptive the Corps is to, to this? Yeah, and so with respect to, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll be honest and say, I don't know, I don't think that the core is necessarily against it. And so the Yazoo pumps come with long sort of history and backstory as it relates to both a political side of a political side of the equation as well as um, preventing or reducing the amount of flooding. So there is that particular situation is, if you will, a, a tricky wicket and everything um, in terms of how these natural infrastructure solutions are gonna be helpful. Generally, however, the core is open to natural climate solutions, natural infrastructural projects. I mean, the infrastructure bill that's coming through contains a big chunk of money that's been put up by various representatives to support natural infrastructure projects. Um, one of the things that we have actually been talking about in the Delta is how we can better sort of relate or get in conversations with the core about these solutions and then bringing our science expertise and our experience and even community voices with us into those meetings with the Army Corps so that we can be on the same page. Because I don't think that the Army Corps is actually, say, against these communities here. They don't want them to flood. They just not might, might not be aware of all of the opportunities out there. So, I mean, I can't even go back. I talked about our tall terrace works. Maybe to some of you, you don't know the distinction between a tall terrace and a regular terrace, but we did an experiment where we built up a terrace to make it six feet tall instead of the regular three. So double in size. And typically when you do a terrace, it provides, you know, a three foot ter terrace provides some amount of protection. But if you have a big, huge storm surge, it's going to be washed away and you have to go back out and build them. Well, the six foot terraces we're seeing are actually holding up much better than those short terraces. And then because they hold up better, you have more opportunities for that vegetation. So right now we're very much involved in trying to get the word out. So everybody who we're talking to as it relates to coastal, coastal restoration, if they're talking terrace work, we're showing them our study and the, what we've been able to do with these tall terraces in terms of pr preserving our coastlines. That's wonderful. That's a great uh, example of how your, your scientists are uh, really supporting um, advancing the mission. I see Ellen with her hand up. Ellen. This is a change of subject. Hi, Don. That was wonderful. Thank Thanks you so much. So much. Um, there's some serious birders on this call. And I'm wondering now that you're down there in the Delta, or maybe not physically yet, but I'm well, here. I'm in Louisiana. It's so oh, exciting. good for you. <laughs> okay. Do you have any inside info 
on ivory billed woodpeckers. Any, so any, I have not. So it's interesting you ask that because I've been prior to coming here, I was in conversation with quite a few people and we were, I will say devastated about the recent declaration of them being extinct and everything. I have not heard anybody say, I know that there are a couple of people who are going out and Jim was mentioning actually who um, helped sponsor this talk that he goes every year in order to go look for ivory billed woodpeckers. And so it's like, I've been in conversations talking to people but I don't have any leads. Um, but I'm mixed, like, I, I, I just got here Sunday. So give me time. <laughs> Um, Don, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about birders a little bit more, um, because I'm I, honestly, I'm surprised about the work that you're, you talked about in New Orleans and facilitating net zero goals and all of that. Um, I, I was not aware that Audubon was doing such work. And, and so I'm curious about how do you make the case uh, to, you know, the, the birders who are, you know, very, I think, strong-willed and focused people that this is a part of the mission of Audubon and they should, they should continue to support you. Yeah, it's actually not that hard. And especially, I will say, here in the Delta region where we have a lot of sort of oil and gas initiatives coming through. And so, for instance, there's a liquid natural gas um, plant that wants to be put in and we are providing comments basically saying, not in this place. And we have all these birders who are also saying not in this place because mm -hmm. where they want to build is where is a really good birding habitat. Mm -hmm. And I think it was two or three years ago now, they already put in a plant in a one particular area that took away access to a birding platform. Like it now sits out there abandoned because in between it and, you know, the road is a liquid natural gas um, facility. And so, yeah, it's not hard to get birders on board when you're talking about taking away really great habitat for birding. Um, when you're talking about an area where you might even be adding some amount of pollution or whether it be noise or water, et cetera. So it's like, these are the things that impact you, your ability to actually bird that make it so you can't just sort of walk out your back door, but you have to go farther and farther to find those habitats where you're going to have, you know, a whole array of species rather than just one or two. And can you talk a little bit more about um, the renewable energy um, uh, piece of, of that? part of what Audubon is doing, you know, not being a birder myself, I'm, I only hear on the edges that, oh, you know, folks are upset because uh, the, the turbines, you know, kill birds or, you know, what opportunities are there to actually put solar panels um, across fields, but still provide native vegetation that would support habitat. You know, I, I see the potential for lots of conflicts there. And I wonder if you can talk through some of those. Yeah, sure. So I'll talk when, so where we're working currently in large part in New Orleans and Little Rock, and then in, um, I think it's the Jackson, basically we're working in cities. And so in large part, that is getting us to a point where we can move away from fossil fuels where, from where we get our energy. So that whole sort of net zero energy perspective that we're looking at. And yes, renewables are a part of that um, that platform or that campaign that we are pushing forward. And then outside of our cities, as you've noted, you do want to make sure that you're siting in places that are not going to be detrimental to birds, wildlife, and other habitat. And that's where our science comes in again. So we provide comments, again, saying not here or over here, or putting it here will allow us to put in XYZ as it relates to native plants. Even with respect to the Gulf, you know, the same thing with respect to siding and sort of saying we want wind energy in the Gulf. Here's how to do it responsibly. That's always the key with renewables is making sure that you're keeping that responsible line front and center. And so we try to do that by informing with science as well as by considering what community members want. So that's the other side of the equation is when you're talking to your communities and what they're pushing for and what they want and they need and how can we make sure those two items are dovetailing to get to the solutions we want. 
Excellent. I, I'm not sure um, how much you are focused on on policy and legislation that seems to be coming down the pike, the infrastructure bill and all that. But can you tell us um, uh, if, if you or your policy director, are you feeling hopeful about what you're definitely what you're Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, we're not, we're not getting everything that we wanted, but there are definitely aspects that are making us hopeful. And I mean, just to some extent, the consideration of some of these renewable initiatives across the country and, you know, the support for some amount of study in some places, that part is making us really hopeful. We are, we have, I will say from Audubon's perspective, while we typically talk about birds, we are beginning to realize more and more that it's not, birds aren't the only ones when you're talking about these infrastructure projects. So it really is, again, about circling back to those communities and what's gonna be good for the communities. And when it comes down to a lot of that infrastructure stuff, it is, hey, jobs, we're gonna make boosts in the economy. We're going to you know, provide clean water, clean air for these communities. And that really gets your legislators on board and has made it so that you know, what's coming down, again, not perfect, but at least is a step forward, really a big step forward for helping to, pro helping to protect birds and people. Yeah, it seems like you're making that case for the co-benefits that come from Definitely. green infrastructure so much. Ellen, did you have another question? Well, I did. I'm teaching a bird conservation class this fall, first time associated with this semester, semester that we're having. And uh, I'm just enjoying it so much. And the students are so great. And da, 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 da. Um, but I think some of them at least might want to end up where you are, Dawn. And I'm wondering either either question you can choose, okay? What okay. more preparation might you have liked to have had while you were still a student in terms of interdisciplinary or access to business or whatever? Or different question, if you'd like, which is how do you spend a day? So ha. what does the day consist of? I spend my days on Zoom. <laughs> so I used to joke about, let's see, when I, I, when I, I was at the hike preserve, that's where I sort of went after I decided to make the leap from academia. And I used to joke that I had, I was on the accel accelerated professor track, if you will, because at some point in time, when you talk to professors, they're like, oh, I don't do any field research and everything. I'm mostly writing grants and meeting with students and whatever to move things forward. And that's what it feels like a little bit, depending on where you are in the conservation world. And people will talk about, there's the administrative side of things and then there's the science side of things. And so you can stay on the science track and gen I will say generally continue to do sort of field work type um, endeavors. On the administrative or management side of things, you, I would say the exciting part about it and the reason why I've made the leap is because you get to be involved in the decision-making a lot more. So it's not necessarily, you know, science, you report up and then decision-makers, I'm quite honestly, decide what to do with that science and how it touches down, and how we're gonna prioritize and work forward. And we look at the budgets and the capacity and we say, yes, this is how we're gonna move forward. And I really like that. I am a type A personality and whatever. So I like the ability to sort of say, hey, look at all this data and here's how we're gonna chart a path forward. Um, but speaking to your first question in terms of preparations that I wish I had, I, I used to always start out saying I would like some business trainings, budgets, how to do marketing, how to like do engagement and everything. And I mean engagement beyond what we so typically think of in terms of broader impacts. I mean, real engagement where you're like, I have people who are engaged and they are actually moving the needle forward. Like we do with our advocacy where we're saying, I need what's, what's happening in your community. Tell me how I can be of help and everything. And now how can we work together to move forward to our same goals? Like that's the kind of engagement that I felt like it was hard for me to initially to get together. And mainly, mainly because I was expecting it to be some magic, whatever answer but really was a lot about talking to people and then like being honest when you say I can do X and then going out and doing that. But I do, I do wish I had sort of larger experience as it relates to marketing and outreach and all of that um, when I was preparing, when I was getting my PhD and all of that, or even when I was an undergrad. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
that's that's very helpful for us who are thinking about more and more of how we can embed that into the academic programs that that we're involved with. Um, do you get to do much of that conversation, that talking with with local folks? Definitely. I'm, I'm curious about how you work more with the local chapters too. Yeah, and so I just got here out like again. I just got here Sunday and everything, and I know that. So I've been talking to local chapter members. I actually have you know talk. Or, and our meeting for in the new year with our local chapter here in Baton Rouge. Then, like I said before, with respect to the campus chapters, because those are stewarded in large part nationally and everything, I've been having conversations about with our national members and some chapter members about, okay, what are our next steps, especially because the Delta is a brand new region. Um, with respect to chapters, a lot, so let's see, as I work with them, some of them are on my advisory board and they will continue to be so because they are really like our on my on the ground, you know, agents for lack of a, re a better word. Then when we want to do advocacy efforts, when we want to do stewardship efforts, we do turn to our um, our chapters in terms of saying, hey, these are the opportunities and things that we've got available. I will say that in the Delta, we need to do better. And that was in small part why I ended this talk with that call for advocacy, because it seems, I know it seems like for many people, it's like, oh, that's a huge reach. I'd much rather go out removing invasive species for a day. But actually, we're talking about like writing a letter to your legislator, which I feel like everybody should have lots of practice on doing. And we are like, we will give you the tools. Sometimes we even draft letters and we're like, hey, you know, tweak it as you see fit and please pass it along. But getting involved in that sort of day to day and realizing that that's a way you can be an advocate, you can be involved without even having to leave your home. So if you can't make that stewardship activity, you can do that from the comfort of your living room. Yeah, great. Um, a student asks about your your su supporters, your base, and, and wonders sort of where they fall politically. And in terms of, I guess, environmental nonprofits, maybe it's a little bit more conservative relatively with Audubon. And I don't know yeah. if that great, if, are there challenges that you face with that? Well, I guess I'll say yes. We, I think, what is it? Elizabeth Gray, who is our interim CEO, she did her sort of, when she took the position, she did her uh, six month walk around. And Audubon does indeed lean to the right. We are a little bit more conservative than other um, big green organizations, if you will. But I would say, as it touches down on the ground, it is not as thorny and prickly as you might think. And I like, I know I'm probably like, you're like broken record, but it really is about talking to the communities you're working. So, it, and like, like really when we're talking Louisiana, Arkansas and everything, we are talking about communities that are impacted by storms, that have energy, like aging energy infrastructures. And literally everybody is on board with, I would like it to cost my energy bill to cost less and everything. I would like to have clean water and air. And so those are the tidbits where you come in and we are, you know, I guess you could say, we joke at least that we're conservative only because we are taking the time to sort of say, here's the jobs, here's the economic impact that's gonna happen over here. In addition to all of these um, conservation impacts that we're gonna have with respect to this work. So really it's not as prickly, although there are moments for sure where we're like, you know, what, working with a partner on one thing, everything is all great and dandy. And then they're over here doing something else. And we're like, <laughs> <laughs> So it happens, that is true, um, but we try to keep, you know, in front of us the positive, if you will. Right. Excellent. Well, um, realizing we only have a few more minutes left, so I wanted to give an opportunity to anyone else who might have a question to, to speak up. Or Don, if you have final thoughts, I'll give you the platform. No, it's just been really great. I appreciate having the time. Thank you, guys. Great. Well, I think then we'll close and everybody can have a few more minutes before your one o'clock. Don, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and energy. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Again, good to see everybody's faces. And hi, Danielle. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>